Okay, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, one-off uh, special event from the Professional Law Institute, looking at the state of innovation in professional legal services. My name's Chris Howard. I'm the Director of Professional Legal Education at King's College London. And it's my pleasure to host our panelists today and our collaborators, Meridian West and Speranti and Earl's Ferry Advisory. I'm just gonna start with a, a quick housekeeping point. So we are now live, uh, this session is being recorded uh, and will be available on the Professional Law Institute website after the event. Uh, you won't be able to contribute uh, verbally today, but we do have a Q&A function. So throughout this event, if you have questions, please do type them into our Q&A box. I'll be moderating those questions as they come in. Uh, and we'll be trying to answer as many as we can as possible. I can't promise that we'll answer all questions today, but we'll do our very best to answer as many as we can. The session is going to be broken into two parts. We're going to start with uh, a presentation from Ben Kent and Simon Drain, uh, where they'll be presenting the report that we're launching today and uh, the basics of their findings in summary. And then after that, we'll be joined by our other two panelists, uh, Tamsin Anasati Pace and Richard Kemp. And we'll be having an open panel session where they'll be discussing some of the outcomes of the report uh, and some of the findings from their perspective within the sector. Now, I'd like to start with a quick uh, introduction to this report and uh, a welcome and introduction to our panelists. The Professional Law Institute at King's College London is part of the Dixon Poon School of Law and our mission is to develop new educational strategies in professional legal education and also to work with industry and work with partners throughout the legal sector. And our goal is to really represent and bring the public uh, domain the latest innovations and developments within legal practice. Ben Kent uh, is the founder of Speranti and Meridian West, consultancies devoted to advising firms at the highest level on how to innovate and how to develop strategy uh, that's client focused. Ben spoke at one of our talks earlier in the year. We have a series each year called the Future of Legal Practice and Ben kindly joined our panel to talk about legal technology. And in that talk, he introduced some of the findings from this research report, of which he's going to expand on today. And when Ben came to us and said that he was looking for support in preparing this report in a format that could be uh, launched to the public, we at the Professional Law Institute were delighted to do so. A couple of quick thank yous uh, in terms of this report. Obviously, I'd like to thank Brilliant West and uh, Ellsbury Advisory and Speranti for bringing this report to us. But I'd also like to thank our internal team as well, particularly Christine Cerullo, who I hope is uh, with us today from uh, tuning in from Canada, who did a huge amount of work in the preparation uh, and presentation of this report. I'd also like to thank Madeline Ryan for setting up today's event, uh, our senior events officer at King's, and also to Mitchell Davis, who's helping us with the uh, technical support today. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction to our speakers and then I'm going to hand over to Ben and Simon for the presentation of this report, which represents the first part of today's session. So Ben Kent uh, started out as a corporate lawyer at Freshfields and he set up Meridian West in 2001. He then later founded Sperante. He's the co-author of the Professional Services Leadership Handbook and in his work at uh, Meridian West and Sperante, he's advised clients like Kent Little, Linklaters, Farr Co. Hogel Levels and others on innovation in a client focused firm. Simon Drain has worked in the professional services sector for the last 25 years. Uh, he spent time developing new investments strategy at LexisNexis, one of the lar largest legal information solutions providers. He also ran the commercial arm of the Law Society and has worked across a whole range of legal tech initiatives. He established Earls Ferry Advisories towards the start of, uh, towards the end of 2018, and has been a major contributor to this report. He also launched a legal tech focused uh, Barclays Eagle Lab Accelerator. Richard Kemp will be joining for the second part of today's talk, is one of the world's top IT lawyers with a particular specialism in new and developing technologies. He was named in the Legal 500's Hall of Fame uh, by Who's Who Legal, who, who's who legal uh, as one of their top 
20 global data law thought leaders. And I think what's particularly interesting about his practice is how it develops and looks at commercial implications of technology in yet to be known areas as they described it. He's been working as a uh, lawyer for many, many years, founding Kemp & Co in 1997, and then most recently Kemp IT Law in 2014. And then finally, Tamsin Anatazi Pace uh, is the head of client solutions at Freshfields Brackhouse Derringer. Uh, she joined from the uh, Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, where she was the deputy director for digital technology. She's also spent eight years at the Economist Group, uh, latterly as their head of global change, and she's a chartered fellow of the Management Institute. And I suppose, again, with that range of experience, the thing that combines all of our speakers is a focus on innovation and how to embed innovation in professional services firms. So from that starting point, I'm now gonna hand over to uh, Ben and Simon for the first part of today's session. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks, Chris. So if we can have the, the first slide and I'll just, just introduce the, the, the work that we've done. Um, if you, if you can click onto the next slide, Madeline, that would be great. So the reason we got into this was really to understand innovation, uh, which I think is more important than ever, given given COVID-19 and, and what we're all seeing. And in addition to, to what Chris was saying, so I've, I've worked in legal tech uh, a, a lot, but also working within accountancy firms and law firms and seeing the challenges firsthand within professional services around driving innovation. And we really wanted to get into understanding how client expectations are really changing um, and they're, they're really changing very rapidly uh, in, in terms of what they expect from the professional services firms. And that innovation really needs to be very much on the on the client service side. So we wanted to tap into that and really understand where people were focused on their, their innovation efforts, what was working well and what wasn't working well. And we've we've published a comprehensive set of data and we're just going to try and give you a flavour for that in this in this brief half hour. So I think the, the macro point, making innovation tangible is really hard <clears throat> within professional services firms because it challenges many aspects of the business model. And we're going to talk about some of the challenges around uh, risk, um, around uh, attitude to risk and around investment uh, as we go through the, the slides in terms of findings. So to understand the positioning, um, we surveyed uh, around 100 professional services firms, and this is really a mix of, of accounting and law firms and, and some others. And we're going to draw out some of the themes that we see coming from that. And the report is obviously published today, so you can get into more detail through the report. So that's that's kind of, if you like, why, why we got into to this. We hadn't seen any benchmarking around uh, innovation that was very tangible uh, for firms and yet it's often talked about. So we wanted to make that real and we'll now call out uh, as Ben takes you through the first stage. Next slide please, please mother. So these are just some of the objectives we cover. So we cover you know what technologies the firms are using, uh, what approach are they taking to innovation, are they using some of the kind of more Silicon Valley type approaches. Um, what are the barriers, both cultural, financial and operational? Have people actually set budgets for innovation or they're having to, are innovators having to beg, borrow and steal budget from elsewhere? And last but not least, are people achieving success? Uh, next slide. So in terms of the, the approach we took, um, we wanted to get a sort of quantitative assessment of what the sort of state of the industry was. So what we did is we did an online kind of diagnostic uh, survey. We sent it out to a kind of mix of partners, leadership teams, people in um, some of the functional heads for marketing and HR. Um, we got over 80 firms uh, took part, um, well over 100 respondents. So we got, you know, in some firms we had more than one respondent. And um, what we did was we also supplemented that with some sort of in-depth interviews. And what we did is we took those survey results and we kind of created a framework to try and understand the different elements of innovation. So you can see those six elements there. So have firms got the leadership in place? What are they investing? What processes do they have? What technology are they actually using? And how sophisticated is that? To what extent are they collaborating with their clients and universities? And last but not least, um, do they have the skills? And from that, we actually created a sort of 
a diagnostic we could score each firm. Next slide. So uh, this is a copy of the report. So um, you can yeah, download this um, from the websites um, straight after this um, call, and it goes into much more detail than uh, we can cover today. Next slide. So let's start with the good news. Next slide. I think the first thing that kind of really struck me is that 62% said that their leaders are providing a mandate for innovation. So when we did this, which was before COVID, you know, the, the legal sector generally had, had, had had several really good years. And our fear was that there really wasn't a kind of mandate for change. But um, what this is showing is, is that is not the case. And actually leaders are really trying to drive it. So it's 18% uh, um, strongly agree, 44% agree. Next slide. I think the other good news is that Professional services are actually good at generating ideas and sharing ideas. I think the kind of partnership structure helps that. But also, um, law firms are typically full of very creative people who are kind of looking for new ideas. So that's not the problem. Next slide. And what's more, well, we're going, we're beginning to put some of the, the kind of building blocks of process around innovation. So. 46% have a head of innovation at a senior level, um, partner level or equivalent. 49% have a structured innovation process and 62% have ideas initiatives. And I think that's pretty impressive actually, um, at just how quickly the firms have, have put those, um, those um, foundations in place. Next slide. And last but not least, in terms of good news, is firms are achieving success. So we asked them in the last two years, what have you achieved as a direct result of innovation? So 69% say they've launched a new product or service. 56% say that it's made employees' lives easier. 49% say that it's enhanced their brand reputation. And it's also, in many cases, helping to attract talent. But I think, the kicker in this is only 18% say that they've achieved significant um, revenue increase uh, as a consequence of this. And I think, I suppose that's the kind of the, the but is we, we, for most firms, we're not yet seeing that kind of very powerful return on investment, but some firms are. Next slide. So that's the good news. Uh, what about the challenges? I think the first challenge is that um, although law firms are making progress, clients' expectations are outpa outpacing professionals' ability to change. Next slide. Next. So um, at Meridian West, we run a kind of annual study of hundreds of buyers of professional services advice, including finance directors and general counsel. And in the last survey, we really focused in on their expectations around um, technology and innovation. And quite startlingly, 58% say they prefer a technology-led solution, even if it means less face time with advisors. And I think our other research is showing that COVID is actually accelerating that trend as people are kind of moving to virtual, the clients are expectation there's, there'll be much more virtual service delivery. Also, there's a fairly jaded view of the response of law firms. So 56% say there's been much talk about service innovation, but little change over the past two years. And, and we've done um, research amongst a large number of in-house lawyers, um, and this is definitely supported um, by that research. And particularly in the big banks and the big TMT businesses, there's a real frustration with their, that their panel firms aren't coming to them with really good ideas. And, I think more importantly, aren't collaborating with them in the way in which they would like. So it's it's really so playing catch up with those expectations. Next slide. So kind of given those high expectations, where are kind of professional firms in terms of their approach to innovation? So what we did is we took the what people were saying about the approach to innovation using that six kind of foundation model, and we um, segmented the different firms into um, these segments from 
as skeptics through to trend followers, enthusiasts, integrators, and digital firms. And what that showed is the good news, I suppose, is that there's only 6% skeptics who really don't think that technology is going to impact them. But also, there's only a minority are kind of up at the digital firm and reintegrated level. And the, the kind of majority are at the kind of trend follower sort of stage. So there's still some way to go um, in terms of maturing. Next slide. I'm going to hand over to Simon. So I think one of the areas that we really identified in this research was this, this challenge around uh, overcoming complacency and risk aversion, which is really quite prevalent within professional services. So if you can click onto the next slide, please. So really what, what, what came from the research was that there are, there are numerous barriers to innovation in terms of why it's not happening. Um, lack of budget, time, feature quite large uh, on that. The top one there at just over 60% that you can see is that staff are too busy to spend time on it, which is kind of ironic when you think these firms are saying important innovation is so central to transforming the client experience and yet staff are too busy. So there are some some questions that this, this really starts to raise. Um, budget constraints, which we'll come on to, came out quite strongly as well. Uh, people really not putting enough uh, dedicated budget towards innovation. And then thirdly, the top one there, there's the skills gap. So firms just really not having the, the, the skills that are needed for this, which we'll come on to in some more detail. So if we can click onto the next slide. So um, the question really to any firm, uh, this, this sort of came out from a survey respondent is, uh, how much of your revenues each year you're prepared to put at risk for innovation? Um, and and that, that really, uh, came came through because the risk averse culture came through. I think it was the, the fifth highest um, barrier, and that that risk aversion um, is really impacting on firms' ability to to address um, innovation. And I, I can say that firsthand, having worked in professional services, both in law and accounting, but then also worked in a FTSE 100 product business, attitude to risk and investment can be quite quite dif uh, quite different. Um, and I think that 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 comes across very much as a challenge for people. So we can click onto the next slide. So another comment from people, so, sorry, from a survey respondent, which was quite telling, was that firms are often unwilling to invest because in effect they have a 100% dividend policy. So you're asking the leaders of the firm to really take a hit on their own, own money today for the benefit of the firm after they've left. And obviously with any sort of capital investment, it could be a number of years before it pays back. And I think this strikes at the heart of the challenge of the partnership model of being able to invest for the future um, when you may no longer be a partner in the, in the business. And certainly from those PE backed professional services businesses that I've worked with recently, they definitely have a different attitude towards capital investments because that partnership structure isn't there. So I think that's that's worth bearing in mind. Next slide. Simon, please. And Simon, I think the other um, thing that I've noticed is that there's often a difference if the leadership team is as young or old. So they tend to be younger, they're kind of more willing to invest now for the return, which is going to hit them in 10 years time. Whereas if it's an older leadership, it was really like, why should I invest when I'll be retired by the time I, we get any payback on this? Um, yeah, absolutely. And also the, the, the consensus model of, of, of the not having a corporate structure, needing to have the, the number of partners that you have to have buy into to these things, I think can sometimes get in the way as opposed to a corporate structure. So in terms of uh, the statistics from, from the report that we got, 20% um, of firms feel that they have a culture of taking risks, failing fast and, uh, and trying again. So we've got a very large number that really, you know, they don't feel they've got that, that support in terms of failing, learning and, and, and moving on. Um, and I think that's that's a challenge because that will always then constrain how innovative you can you can really be. So, so moving on, clicking on the next slide, please. Um, moving on from looking at uh, attitudes to risk, the other challenge that surfaced from this is really knowing where to focus. Um, innovation is such a broad term and is used in so many different ways by different people. Uh, what came across from the study was 
a lot of firms really struggling in terms of where they focus on this. So if we can click onto the next slide. So we, we explored with um, firms the type of uh, technologies that they were using, because for a lot of them, really, it was about uh, technology use um, that was really driving their focus on innovation. So uh, I'm not going to talk through the, the detail of the slide given time, but there's more in the, the report if you'd like to read it. So we asked a bunch of questions around where they were actually focusing their, their times uh, around use of AI tools, self-service portals, um, project management tools, dashware, dashboard software, and, and, and so on. Um, things like uh, contract management and contract review uh, didn't come out as, as strongly as we thought they might have done. Um, and there was a, quite a split between the tools that people are using for internal based uh, innovation um, versus client focused. And I, I think that's a, a macro theme right across this is not enough firms are really focused on the, the client side, how you're transforming the client experience. A lot are more focused on uh, internal efficiency gains. Um, and I think you'd be hard pressed to find a client that, that cares too much about that other than you know, if, it, if it reduces their fee. I think so the, other thing, slide. the other thing, Simon, I think we've noticed when we've worked together looking at contract automation is that the technology is often just used in pockets of the firm. So it might be used in one practice area, you know, commercial contracting, but it's not spread, it's not universally kind of adopted um, wherever there's contracts. Yeah, c c completely, completely agreed, Ben. Um, and so this was a, I won't spend, spend long on this, but this was a, a comment that's flashed up on, on, on the screen now in terms of making sure that you've got the, the, the right focus uh, in terms of technology. So moving on to, to the next slide, there are, there are firms and we could we could call out call out many. Um, there are firms who are very much focused on the external transforming the client experience um, and doing that in a way in which they, they're using technology and blending technology and, and legal services in a very effective way. So we could call out Kennedy's. We could also call out firms like uh, TLT who are doing some great stuff with with TLT one. Um, and merging together you know, contract automation and review and, and so on. So some firms are taking that approach and, and looking at innovation very much from, from the client side. So it is happening, but I would say it's in it's just in pockets. Um, if we can click on to the next slide, the, the, other, the other set of people we've seen are, and, and there's more detail of this in the report, those who are setting up the incubators and the incubators to keep abreast of the, the latest thinking um, and act as a, you know, a, a place to really explore how um, legal practice is, is changing. And I think they, they, they each have a place in the innovation journey, but they have a, they have a different place. Um, and I think what we also found from the report was people not necessarily being clear what the goals were at the outset and therefore which, which models they need to deploy. So we can click onto the next slide. The next um, challenge that we really surfaced was uh, firms lacking the capabilities to drive uh, through implementation um, of their, their innovation initiatives. Next slide. So only 29% of firms that we surveyed as part of this think that staff have uh, basic understanding uh, and competencies for innovation. And when you, you marry that with what Ben was talking about earlier on, the number of firms who have innovation processes, um, you know, if, a, if a, a third of these firms you know, don't feel that they, they, their staff have got basic understanding and they don't have processes, but they feel this is fundamentally important, then you can start to, to really see the disconnect that, that, that emerges. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> so we called out design thinking just as one of the, the methodologies. And it, it was interesting um, to, to see that this is being deployed uh, in some organisations. Um, so design thinking, the principles behind it, uh, it, it essentially really just focused on the customer and the problem rather than the technology. I think what what was interesting, though, was when we looked at the techniques used by firms, the thing that came out strongest was 62% uh, of you know, the people have got ideas initiatives. Now, while this sounds great, I think the challenge that, that we see is um, while there may be ideas initiatives to, to gather innovative ideas, if you remember back to the earlier stat I was showing you, it, it said that all staff are, or most staff are too busy to do anything about it. So 
you, you there's a there's a risk in firms that they put out these ideas initiatives staff are too busy to to act on it and then you just create this sense of dissatisfaction and, and not seeing change and i think we see that coming through from some of the client work we've done recently as well mm -hmm. uh, clients say we keep hearing about how innovative you're being and, and, and going to be uh, and yet we're not really seeing action we're not really seeing transformation of the experience so i think firms have got a lot more to do in terms of the techniques that they're actually using for for innovation i think um Again, this is, I think, somewhere where professional firms could, could have learned from the PE funds because they, they, what they do is they work at pace, you know, and they, they, with a discipline and pace. So they'll take an idea and then they'll have a process for picking the right idea, evaluating it, getting client research on it, and then launching it and marketing it in an effective way. And I think um, it, only a few of the big law firms have those capabilities. Simon and Ben, I'm just going to jump in and say that uh, we've got about a couple of minutes left for, for the presentation, so uh, I yep. can ask you to wrap up yep. soon. We've got one, one question. Which we're, we're, we're just, we're pretty much near the end. Okay. I, I, th I think I completely agree, Ben, and I think um, it, that that pace and that rigour that, that I see working with PE-backed businesses um, is, is, is often lacking. And if we could come mm -hmm. to, the, to the next, the, the last slide of my piece, um, and I think a large reason for that is lack of skills being a significant barrier. So I think many professional services are, are yet to fully realise that they need to bring in dedicated roles to, to address innovation in the same way that they have dedicated roles for, for marketing or for IT. And I think those firms that are more focused on that and have then created a very client centric approach to those innovation roles uh, are perhaps doing better than, than the others. So I think there's a big takeaway, which is really focus on the skills that are actually needed to 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 deliver on this. And I'm just going to hand over to Ben to talk about uh, on the next slides um, what successful innovators do. Yeah, so I thought to end on a, a kind of positive note. So what we did is we looked at the firms that have been really successful at this and, and what were the characteristics. I think the first thing is the leaderships provide a real sort of long term vision for transformation. So they look kind of five years hence and kind of almost sketch out what they want their firm to look like and then what the, sort of the steps are to, to achieving that. Um, so not just going on a sort of purely kind of ad hoc incrementalist approach, which I think comes most naturally to law firms, which is very trial and error, but with no central vision. I think the second is it's super important to have the managing partner, the senior partner really behind this because Politically, driving through change in any firm is quite difficult. Um, and especially if you're trying to ask, you know, asking for budget or you're asking for partners who are very successful people to work in different ways. So that kind of relentless, enthusiastic leadership is it really is really important. And you, and you can see that in the top firms. I think the third area is it's probably one of the hardest ones actually, is you know, how do you over develop this culture where it's okay to try and try and fail. It's drilled into you when you're a young lawyer that you mustn't make mistakes. And, and when you're drafting, that's absolutely right. But when you're innovating, it's it's fatal. And what's interesting is actually the clients are saying, come to us with an early ideas and we will together refine them. You don't need to have the finished product before you come to us. And, and a few firms are doing that pretty well. The fourth top tip is it's super easy to be kind of bamboozled by the technology and the latest AI tool and just buy it in. But I think it's much more important that you start with what's the problem you're trying to solve? What's the pain point? Um, and that will enable you to be much more focused. Next slide. I think also setting aside some budget for incremental innovation. If there's no budget set aside, and or you've got to beg, borrow and steal it from IT, it's really difficult to take any idea and develop any further. It doesn't need to be a huge budget, but it needs to be something and be, and be prepared to, to lose some of that budget. Not all of it will be successful. Next. I think also use the techniques. There is actually, innovation is not a kind of mystic art. There are processes and approaches, so do use design thinking and innovation techniques and do involve your clients early on. Um, 
Next one. And I think last but not least is, is persevere. Um, there's no quick wins in terms of innovation. It will often take two or three years to, to get results and you need to kind of work through that. And then last slide really is, next slide, is what not to do. So don't just buy the latest technology. Don't be perfectionist. Don't just innovate in a bubble with an innovation group and not spread it across the firm. And also look at the incentives for individuals. So if the incentives for associates is to get your chargeable hours up, it's extremely unlikely that you're going to dedicate a lot of your day to um, incubating new ideas because it will look bad when you come to appraisal. Thanks so much. That's the uh, end of the presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ben. It was fantastic. And I think that, you know two things I wanted to add to to my introduction. First of all, I think that you know what you've done really well there is is talk about the reality uh, yeah. of innovation, what it means, uh, 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 and what it is. Because I think there's a lot of talk about innovation, technology, and and lots of surrounding Sorry. issues. And you said innovation is a wide catch, but it's not just uh, about technology. It's about much more. So I think yeah. that, that's, a, that's a really important point. And I think the other thing that uh, you can take away. Uh, to our listeners for, from the report is tools is actual some guidance on how to both benchmark against uh, uh, other practices but also to uh, develop your approach in a way that will actually foster innovation okay we're going to come to questions now we've had uh, well, i've got a first question for, from the audience and then uh, if other listeners now could start piling in with your questions you've heard uh, an awful lot there from uh, Simon and, and uh, from Ben in a short time, which is fantastic. So now please do start to populate the Q&A. Um, I'm going to lead off with a question that uh, came in uh, towards the end of the presentation, which I think picks up on a really important point, uh, and it's around finance and revenue. Um, I'll just read the question out. Uh, it says, I've heard it said that investment is easier where there's a committed revenue stream. I think I agree, and my view is that the challenge on investment isn't just on the law firm side, but also on the buyer side. And what do the speakers think about that? Um, so uh, we, we're just going to go to our, our speakers now. We're going to uh, ask around that. So we could, could I ask Ben, who, who if you want to start off and uh, do hand over to who thinks best place for that question. So is it easier where there's a committed revenue stream? And do you think the challenge is on the buyer side? Simon, you got a view on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, so so definitely. I, I think um, the, the, the macro view from the from the research showed that most people are focusing, or more people are focusing on internal innovation, and, and the reason is because it's easier than focusing yeah. on the the client innovation, and it's a lot harder to collaborate with clients and ask those types of questions. I think once you really start understanding, asking about the pain points, and you be, being prepared to revisit what you think you know which can be quite challenging for lawyers and accountants who feel they've already you know, know their client very well, then you can really unearth the, the proper pain points. Then you can associate with that what, it, what it's worth to the client to fixing that, and then you can build revenue streams from that. So I think it, it's essential for client side innovation to be able to put revenue numbers on it. And you know, a limited number of people are driving material revenue from it, but it is quite small, as Ben said, said early on. Um, I think what you've got to do though is you've got to create a pot to drive innovation to get you to those answers because you can't answer those things right up front and you've got to be prepared to fail in these things. So you've got to have a pot to be able to explore with clients and to identify and build the business cases you know, through really understanding what those propositions need to look like. Um, but you've got it's about how you can rapidly do it. And we've got a model set out in the um, in, in the report, if people are interested, of how you can rapidly iterate to, to, to get to those get to those views. But I think leadership care most about um, how does this impact our revenues? And I think people are only scratching the, the, the surface of, of how innovation can drive that. Richard, do you have a view on that? You know, because you've worked with a lot of the, the, the top law firms. Do you have a sense of the, the return on investment piece? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's. I mean, it's 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 clearly easier to get buy-in from the firm when when you feel you have um, a, a, a revenue stream out there, and, and a lot of this um, innovation is happening at a time pre 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 revenue. Mm. Um, I think you've got to find 
um, the right client to work with. Um, and Ben, this echoes your point about, you know, it, it's really um, a problem in search of a solution, not, not, not the other way around. Um, in, in terms of investment, you've got this mix of internal things and external things. Mm. So I, th I think, you know, what does the firm want from its investment? You know, what's the objective? This goes to strategy where you want to be in one, two, five years time. Um, and, and I think that's a good point to sort of focus on is, you know, what does the firm want as a return on investment? You know, there are loads of things, as the report brilliantly says, you know, engaging everyone in the firm. You get, you know, yeah. major <laughs> enhancements, marketing plus points to increase the, the, the proximity of the relationship with the client. Um, but we keep coming back to this sort of law firm point, which is that the economics of tech and law firms are really different. In a law firm, you're looking to monetize legal time to deliver partner profits this year. Yeah. Tech business, you're investing for a greater return later. You know, you can, uh, uh, you, 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 you don't have a geometric uh, progression with, with, with people's time. It's very linear. Um, but investing now for a greater return later when you've got sort of partner age groups and demographics to take into account is a huge change to the law firm model. Um, so I would say, you know, the sensible thing to do is, is to find the clients where um, you think that your uh, innovation and your investment will find a return, probably means larger clients with legal operations teams yeah. looking at this the whole time. Um, and I think the key thing keeps coming back to this, it's going to be really interesting to see, particularly if we're in for tougher times, if law firm partners are prepared to forgo income this year um, for the possibility of a bigger pot in the future. Yeah, and I think the other thing I can observe is that um, if you get it right, the revenue streams from a sort of technology or subscription service can be extremely attractive yeah. because um, you can get, if you get scale, you can get kind of hyper profit margins and yeah. also you can lock people in sort of year on year. So yeah. you're, you're, um, it's, it, it's a very nice um, hedge for good yeah. times bad. Um, yeah. um, Ben, can I just jump jump in yeah. with a follow up question uh, that that, that uh, another member of our audience has asked, which is uh, sort of connected. It said you've mentioned that eighteen percent of your interviewees get significant revenue benefit. I'm, I'm guessing from in, from innovation. Uh, yeah. What are some of the best examples of the innovations that lead to significant results? And typically, how long did it take to achieve those results? So you just mentioned. Uh, one example there, but I don't know if you'd like to expand on that. So what, what examples are there of innovations that have led to significant results and, and what was the time lag in doing so? Um, just, just, just talking from my experience, I think um, the I think the firms that had most success tend to be the, the, lot, the bigger firms. They, you know, they're the, they are the most sophisticated and particularly the ones servicing big financial services institutions. And I think, you know, it started with Linklaters and Blue Flag well, many years ago, actually. But I think those kind of online subscription services um, have proved pretty profitable. Um, but I think that actually, I think the really interesting thing is how technology can help you sell in the really big deals. And that's super attractive to the partners. So if you've got two firms pitching for, you know, a regulatory investigation, one has sophisticated technology tools and the other doesn't, it gives you the USP to win that matter. And of course that delights the partners because that's what sort of the big matters that they like. Uh, Tamsin, I just wonder what your perspective is on that. And also because you come from an outside of the, the sector, um, so seeing it afresh, what are your views on this? Um, I, I, I think I'd agree around the the point you just made on um, essentially it's opportunity loss as opposed yeah. to incremental value at this point. Um, and, and I've seen that across a number of different industries mm. where there is an expectation of a short term investment. It might be high, but it is we're going to capex something at three years yeah. without necessarily the appreciation that that needs to be maintained you need a new skill set in your 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 um, workforce and then it's not necessarily going to give you a whole new revenue stream it's going to ensure and protect your existing revenue stream oh, yeah. and I think that can sometimes be very hard in terms of that that sort of palatable um, huge number on a budget sheet. Um, 
because of the point that you're you're not you're not suddenly going to see that that return um, it, hugely. But if you look at how other industries and I spent a lot of time in media the, if you if you are complacent over these things and um, media was very complacent over the internet and thought yes. oh well there's there's a whole thing and everyone will still buy newspapers it will be fine um, that that you know obviously long term if you've missed that boat and if you haven't taken advantage um, you, you you can't catch up and it's actually that your existing revenue started to decline as opposed to you you've even missed that point of getting new revenue in. And do you think people are feeling that threat at the moment? Is it a kind of is COVID accelerating the fear that actually our, our model might be undermined in the future? I, I as, as said previously, I'm afraid I don't have too much experience within yeah. uh, the legal. I've been in here for a year, but what I do think is that um, looking across a number of industries, when we, we don't necessarily as individuals consider our experiences in in different silos as an individual i pick up my iphone mm. i have all my apps on it from the morning straight through to the evening and when there is a bump in that because i'm at work and i have to deal with somebody else who doesn't have a system that, that correlates with what i'm trying to do and um and, and somehow disrupts that that's when that sort of irritation and, and sort of conflict comes along so i think that in general as we've all moved particularly to virtual situations and everything's there i think it has highlighted areas where you don't have that into um the interaction and the engagement in in the the sort of the technologies. Okay. And any other lessons for the legal sector from what you've you've seen elsewhere in terms of the approach to innovation? You know, what do you put um, in <laughs> What would you I, introduce? I, there's a there's a behavioural mindset which you have highlighted um, that sort of agile thinking, design thinking is something that within technology industries have exi has existed for over a decade, sort of 15, 20 years. And so it comes naturally to people to fail fast, to yes. test things out, to not have the full answer to, to those sorts of things. And I think that's um, that can be a bit of a struggle, is, is changing that, that sort of mindset. But I would also say that where I've seen um, in other industries innovation fail in one corporation as opposed to another is when it is siloed. And you, and you highlighted this in the report. If you have an innovation team that is somehow considered separate, it's yeah. sort of, they have, they have bean bags, you know, everyone else's offices. <laughs> separate. I think in those situations, it, it, it feels like a very alien side of things. And then yeah. adoption becomes difficult. So I think you do have to consider innovation as something that's embedded um, throughout sort of the culture. Interesting. Can so I just you, jump in there, uh, yeah. uh, at that point, if I may? Uh, one, one, I'm going to roll together two questions, one of which uh, we've sort of uh, pre-prepared, but another which is... Chris, I can't hear you. We lost Chris. Um, Richard, can you? Um, lost Chris. <laughs> um, let me also jump in with a question can, here. Could, is, I, um, could, I just, could I just build on the point that, that oh, Tamsin was making there? Because I think what, what's what's really interesting is, and I think it ties into to something that um, uh, Richard was saying before as well. I, I, I just wonder whether um, consumption patterns of of consumers of services is just changing overall and legal services, accounting services and some level have to then they're, they're no different because the people we're selling into are those same consumers who use Apple and everything else. And so people's expectation of service provision is is shifting. And I think if I think about my own experience, so I thought First Direct was amazing 20 years ago, but now mm -hmm. I'm so frustrated I've just switched to Monzo because my experience, my, my expectation has changed. And I think what, what becomes interesting is when you look at legal services and you stop seeing it as a 
a uh, service provision and see it as an outcomes basis and say, how do we deliver outcomes in a different way? So you see it through the consumer's eyes. Then you start to really consider how could we how could we deliver this in a different way? How can we monetize it in a different way? What could that mean to our, our revenue streams? And also what happens if we don't? If we don't change fast enough, do we become the first direct that seemed really innovative and now Monzo over yeah. time? for example and i think so i think there is that to, to the point earlier not having it as a separate function having it very mm. tied to the client experience and how you transform the the outcomes that law firms are, are delivering to their clients i think it's quite important it's interesting um, um, so just just to, sorry to interrupt just talking of technology there so i was abruptly kicked out of the meeting for a few moments <laughs> apologies that, uh, that i, I lo lost uh, that thread hopefully i'll stay in this time um OK, two two questions from our um, from our uh, audience members. Um, first of all, do we think that uh, do we need to be careful not to focus too much on technology innovation when people still buy people and clients still want a human relationship with their advisor, especially on complex and sensitive matters? And I think that's a really key question for lawyers, obviously. Mm. Um, and it kind of connects with a, a, a question we had, which was how should young lawyers prepare themselves for the new world? I think it's this connected point around the balance between, as you've said in the presentation, getting really excited about technology, but at the same time keeping a focus on, on the human and, and the importance of, of that relationship. And then a second um, question, which you can deal with separately, but leads on. Uh, what role does blockchain technology have in law firms and have you de detected any law firms already using blockchain to provide a better service to their clients? So one question about are we focusing too much on technology? Secondly, in terms of the specific blockchain technology, where is that implicating? So, Ben, I don't know if you want to field that to the panel. Yeah, Richard, do you want to pick up that that first question? You know, is human or technology, or a bit of both? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, I, I think it's a bit of both. I, uh, um, I don't think it's a question of, of of not focusing too much on technology, if that's not too many negatives. Um, I think technology for the first time is starting to become really, really important for law firms. There's been a lot of noise about it over the last 10 years, last 20 years, um, but now it's becoming really important. And it's, as Tamsin said, it's for these defensive reasons and it's for these sort of offensive or new revenue generation uh, 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 reasons as well. Um, you know, it's the old thing, people uh, underestimate change long term and overestimate change short term. Um, but I think now for the first time you can start to see five to ten years out where technology will be embedded in the cloud, AI, machine learning, mixed reality, it will all be embedded in law firms in a way that it that 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 you know people haven't really conceived of yet, I think almost. That's not to say that the and it's a typical kind of lawyer's response, I'm afraid, sort of on the one hand, on the other hand, but of course, um, for uh, business to business legal services at, at the high end of the market, um, that relationship um, is, is absolutely critical and will continue to be critical. You entrust your big law firm with your most difficult, sensitive, important decisions um, and, and, you know, there's, it, it, one of the reasons that law is so conservative is that it takes a long time to develop this brand, the brand of trust and awareness and, and all these good things. Um, and that's not going to go away. It's just that particularly in the, in the, the, the larger projects, part of it will become uh, uh, automated and part of the standardizable componentry of big deals, whether it's M&A, finance due diligence, contract automation, litigation discovery, um, there will be more tech around that. So I think it's a combination of the two. It's the importance of the brand for these really difficult projects, but the importance of the technology that backs it up. Okay. Simon, do you have a perspective on that one? No, I, I completely agree with that. I think the, the way I tend to think about law or accountancy is, anything that is process based rules based will become systematized at a point in time and i think we're we're still at a relatively early stage you've only got to look at document automation that's you know i, I was launching offerings around that for for lexis years and years ago now and it's still i still wouldn't consider it to really be mainstream yet so i think we've still got a long way to go on that um systematization of 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 law and and of accountancy 
but I, I completely agree with with Richard that there's that high end piece which will never be uh, replaced. I think the, the the question becomes how how law firms start to deliver almost a technological platform to, to mm. their clients so that those things that could be commoditized if you want to use a negative word can be delivered so that they're in pole position when it comes to the added value advisory piece. So I think you know, perhaps firms need to think more about um, uh, how they're going to position themselves well for the added value pieces, which will never be replaced by technology. And I agree. And I think at its best, technology kind of can take away a lot of the drudgery of document review and, and drafting, which frees you up to have more time for those kind of trusted advisor conversations. I also think that advice is going to be more around not well, just drawing on experience, more data analytics, so how to interpret data on contract performance. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd imagine that, um, if, that that's something that Tamsin you would speak to in terms of data analysis. And Tamsin, I'd be interested in your take. I don't know if it's something that's come across your radar on on blockchain and its relative importance. Um, not that much within what I've been doing, so I may defer um, to that, I'm afraid. But what I did want to actually add, there was a secondary point to your question around the skill sets for future lawyers. And I think that's an area that we really do need to focus on. And I don't think that's just within the legal industry. I think everything that we are um, that within all industries that we have to ensure that young people coming up out of uh, school and going into the workplace are being prepared for not just having a digital um, awareness and being able to to sort of um, look at data and analysis and things like that, but also having a resilience and ability to change a different type of mindset. And that is something that I think is, is really important as we go through that. So I just wanted to make that point. I'm afraid on blockchain, I'm going to defer to the lawyers on the call uh, for that. So I have a just a, a thought on blockchain. Um, it, it, it gets talked about a lot, but a lot, there's a there's an awful lot of hype around it from, from my perspective. I think what's what's interesting for law is is the concept of smart contracts and how that could potentially build from document automation and you start embedding those smart contracts. Um, I think is is interesting because if you speak to most GCs and you say what are the sorts of things mm -hmm. that worry you. Is basically that the deals get done and they have a lot of contracts on their books, but they don't have clear sight of their liabilities um, yes. or, or potential opportunities for revenue increases. And that's because they're sitting in manual based contracts in a drawer somewhere. If over time those things become smart contracts integrated into contract lifecycle management, then you could do away with a lot of the manual legal tasks. But I, I would say we're at a very early stage of, of the progression. But, 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 but it's, I think it's inevitable that will become more mainstream over time. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, we're coming towards the end of our time. I wonder if uh, perhaps Ben and, and, and our panel could just uh, wrap up with the last few comments. We, we had some other questions in, in mind. If there are any themes, Ben, you want to pick out from, from those, please do so now. But yeah, just a, a last couple of minutes from, from our panel. Yeah, so I think um, we've talked very much about the law firm. Um, I think, what a, you know, for, for the lawyers on the call or people working in law firms, what would be your one tip to kind of prepare yourself for this new world? That's a tough question. Um, Richard, if you were just coming into the profession, uh, what would you be doing? Yeah, uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I think if you look back 20 years, you'd have been hard pressed to find a full time privacy lawyer. And now in the UK alone, you've got hundreds, if not thousands, of data protection yeah. lawyers. Um, and, and that's, you know, a, a function of how it's grown. And I think today, if you look at these specialist areas, particularly AI, it feels like data protection did 20 years ago. And although it's not a distinct field yet, it's a racing certainty that there will be more AI lawyers <coughs> practicing AI law as well as using it in their work. So, I mean, that's just an example. But I think it, it, it's Tamsin's point about sort of get a digital awareness, get at least a layman's understanding of the new areas. Mm. Cloud, I mean, some of them aren't that new, but cloud, data, AI, blockchain, mixed reality, what we've been talking about. And, 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 and I'd sort of echo another point that, 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 that Tamsin made, which is I think learning to learn becomes the key yeah. skill here. It's sort of keeping up to date. I mean, you've, you've got 
you know, in my world, you've got commercial IP regulatory and competition law, but how they're sort of you know, put together to address the legal issues, legal challenges of these new areas is always changing. And it ends up that sort of being confident about learning to learn, I think becomes the key skill. Perfect. And, and Tamsin, can I ask the same question for you? Um, yes, of course, and, and I, I love that, that sort of um, learning to learn and confidence in, in not knowing, but yet going to find yeah. out, um, I think is vital and is something that I think people with maybe my background of lucky enough to have jumped around to different places, you, you sort of develop a bit more um, of a, a positive attitude about, about learning something new. Whereas I do think sort of within the legal industry, current sort of ways of, of going through the process, it can be very daunting. Um, I think I would focus on the client centric point. Mm -hmm. um, I think, but almost tying that in, asking the clients what are their strategies? What are their plans? How can you as um, as an individual, how can you as a firm support your clients and very much put them at the centre of what your plans are and your strategy is going forward? I think sometimes there's almost an assumption that we must know what our clients are doing, but yes. of course they don't always know, particularly in a sort of a situation like this. So actually asking those questions that are less on the legal technical side, but more about their long term um, views of, of the, the industry they're in will then enable you to have that wider conversation about how can we support and then maybe move into that innovation space. It takes quite a lot of confidence actually to ask some of those kind of open ended questions. <laughs> Nothing always come easy to lawyers. <laughs> I, I'm going to um, thank you so much, Tamsin and, and, and Ben. I, I think I'm going to have to call time there because we're nearly at the end of our time. Um, we're just going to put on the screen now uh, a slide which uh, gives some details of where you can find the report. So if you go to kcl.ac.uk forward slash PLI and then we've got a tab there called resources. If you look on that resources tab, you'll be able to download the report there. Um, ben, I think you, you said that you can also download the report on your website as well. Uh, yes, we can be putting on the Meridian West uh, website and uh, also on the Spiranti one. So you can um, look there. We've also got other resources Fantastic. around information so, and technology. Brilliant. So I mean, so there you can find uh, much more detail on all of the themes we've talked about today. Um, so I'm going to conclude just by again, thanking all of our speakers. Thank you to uh, Tamsin Anastasi Pace. Thank you to Simon Drain. Richard Kemp and of course to uh, Ben Kent who, who's been leading the discussion and leading this research. It's it's really been a pleasure to hear the discussion today. Um, again, I'm hoping uh, there are plenty of students as well as practitioners tuning in today and I think a lot of really good, important take homes for them in terms of how to approach uh, innovation as they go forward in their careers and also for the practitioners and, and representatives of law firms uh, tuning in today. I think they'll have had a lot of take home in terms of some of those practical tips on how to embed and how to develop the structures for real innovation. And as I say, do read more about that in the report. Uh, we're very, very proud to uh, be supporting and to be presenting on our site today. So uh, it's coming up to one o'clock. Um, I'll sign off there, but uh, thank you again. And of course, thank you to all of those who've uh, tuned in today, who've come along for today's presentation. It's really great that you could join us. Uh, and thank you for all your questions throughout, which have made for a really stimulating discussion. Somebody asked early on, will the recording of this uh, talk be available? Yes, it will. So again, just to reiterate that you'll be able to listen to this uh, talk again on kcl.ac.uk forward slash PLI. And you can also find there all of our previous Future of Legal Practice talks. Uh, we'll soon be updating the details of next year's Future of Legal Practice talks, which will, I think, also be online. Um, and uh, so please do look at our website for the details of upcoming talks as well. So thank you once again to our speakers. Thank you again to Madeline uh, and to Mitchell for supporting us from the technical side today and also to Christine Cirillo as again, uh, who was fundamental in, in helping produce this report with Meridian West and Speranti. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I think we're going to end there. So I'm going to sign out and uh, we'll bring our event to a conclusion. Thanks, thanks, thank Chris. You. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Ben. Bye. Thank you. Richard.